Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Long Walk Talks. My name is David Hensley. I'm the owner and creative director of Long Walk Productions, and I am quarantined once again with my two co-hosts, Stan Wilson Lee. Howdy. And Chris Wilson Barnes. <laughs> no, none of that. No? You don't like that one? All right, no, fine. No, sir, I don't like Chris it. the Fashion Plate Barnes. No! And we... The fourth wall. You're breaking the fourth wall. <laughs> Again. Yep, that's me. There is no fourth wall. So we are taking a break from our Tarantino coverage after discussing uh, the Tarantino verse and Reservoir Dogs in the last episode to discuss a new topic. Uh, Considering the climate of uh, what's going on right now among the quarantine and the pandemic, uh, we were trying to figure out what, uh, what, how could we get topical without doing something that other podcasts aren't also doing. And my wife had the idea of we should be discussing disaster movies. But again, I figured that there are a lot of podcasts out there right now talking about disaster films and who got it right, who got it wrong, who got it hilarious. So I decided to uh, add a a little Shyamalan twist to it. Today's topic is which disaster movies? fiction plot would you rather be in than the one that we are currently living in so stan why don't you kick us off if you could be in the plot of a fictional disaster be it a movie video game book whatever oh, I could put a video game too yeah oh, any video kind games of are worse <laughs> any kind of disaster in media which plot would you rather be in right now uh since you brought up video games, you know, I actually started a new, a brand new game of Fallout Four. So, um, oh my god, I'm I'm playing from the beginning. Um, you know, getting eaten by death claws and shit, but it's it's awesome. Um, but no, the situation I would that I picked is uh, the day after tomorrow. I'm really gonna need a good explanation from you on this one. Yeah, of all of them, that seems like the weirdest. It made, it, it, especially for you who hates anything other than warm climate. That's what I'm saying is that um, because okay, here's the main reason. It's, okay, it's because it's pretty pro. The prophecies of that movie and the reasons behind the making of that movie, which was based actually loosely based on a book called The Cl- Coming Global Superstorm by Art Bellin. You know, this is the first time I ever called up. Are one of our topics up on my Wikipedia. The uh, first time you've ever actually researched a research. topic that we were discussing in the two years we've been doing this. <laughs> and, I, and I and I watched the movie again last night. And Mark this up. episode down in your calendars. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I know there's a ton of calendars with yeah. long walk talks on it. Um, but, uh, but no, uh, and Whitley Stryber is one of the co-authors with along with Art Bell. Um, and I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Whitley Stryber, but he's like one of the uh, classic science fiction uh, novelists and stuff like that. But uh, I'm assuming this was nonfiction book because it's all about probably you know, depends on who you ask. Right. Because uh, it's all about the global warming crisis and and such. And this was at the early stages of the global warming crisis. Mm-hmm. The, the film came out in 2004, it appears. Um, uh the book, I'm not sure when when that was written, but this was at the early stages, uh, and but the reaction, the reaction, the reactions to the crisis in the movie, um, the stuff that's said about how it was brought about, uh, uh, the global warming aspect, um, which is also part of this situation, but the. But it's mainly the governmental response um, and how long it took the government, especially the U.S. government, to respond to it in the sense of and and how they wanted to. In the deny sense it. that they really still haven't addressed it at all. Ex- uh, but now, but in the movie, the redemption arc of the person of the denier. Of who didn't want to take on the actual news and actually, you know, it's like this is what's happening. I'm giving you the information. Um, this is the right information. What are you going to do with it? And at first, they handed it off to lower 
people. And then after the crisis happens, they realize and and then the situation propels them into a state of redemption arc, basically, is where they went from, oh, I don't agree with you to now I see what you were talking about and uh, I was wrong. Um, this is where we're going to go to now. And the idea that uh, there's a lot of education behind it and... Maybe we're still we talking should. about the day after tomorrow, yes, right? Yes, but the day after you tomorrow. haven't moved on to a better film. <laughs> no, the day after tomorrow is okay. very based in uh, the global warming science and how, even though it was uh, okay, early well, stages at that time, it was on our very, next episode we're going to be discussing Pulp Fiction. On the episode after that, I'm going to bring in a scientist <laughs> who, who explained to you everything that is wrong with the day after tomorrow. Well, I'm sure there's been more, but the idea the idea that the information that they had at that time in the movie i'm sure has been improved upon and been explored and been dealt with but the reactions to the science is very similar to the you know it's denial at first and then the realization of the rightness of the science and the idea that we should be more in tune with our science, you know, with the or science. Or Jake Gyllenhaal's almost going to die in a flood. Or Jake Gyllenhaal is going to die in a flood. And speaking, let's go, let's, this is another reason why I love this movie is mm-hmm. the whole um, Dennis Quaid, man. Okay, Quaid. so see, when you brought this up, here's my question for you. Uh, do you, when, when we talk about a disaster plot that you'd rather be a part of than the one that we are currently living in, are you saying that you want to be Dennis Quaid's <laughs> character or do you want to be in this scenario so you can be his best friend? Or are you just, are you, are you yes, present yes, in yes. the world of yeah. the day after tomorrow in an, I, in the state that you're living in currently and well, the disaster is happening around you? The, the you're, idea. Just, you're just in the day after tomorrow. <laughs> I'd like... If, if I was closely connected to the Dennis Quaid character or the Jake Gyllenhaal character, because this is a very, this is a very um, good example of people working together. Um, the kids, again, the kids are the smartest people in this movie and, um, and, and smartest people in the world, with the exception of Dennis Quaid's character, who is actually taught the smartest people in the world, which are the kids. Um, uh and but nobody listened to Dennis Quaid but fortunately people listen to Jake Gyllenhaal's character who plays Dennis Quaid's son and uh people were able to survive the situation so I would like to been have been connected to this group of people um if I was the Dennis Quaid character I don't know if I could have been because you right, know how everyone much would I have hate. died <laughs> And the, to make the right, tra- you want a main character immunity is what you want. <laughs> yeah, because I just I just want to remind people who haven't seen this movie or haven't in a while, the end of this movie entails the northern hemisphere of the planet becoming a frozen wasteland. Right. Ex- exactly. <clears throat> the entirety uh, of it. It's a new no. ice age. Unfortunately, I did see this movie in the theater way back in 2004. So it has been 16 years since I saw it. I re- distinctly remember not enjoying it. <laughs> um, Chris, this whole time that Stan was talking, you look like you had a lot of hard thoughts. What no, that was feelings? it. That was the thought. This, the the world is half frozen by the end of the movie. The top half is, and it only took seven days. The top half is a snow cone. And <laughs> now, for our listeners at home who have never met Stan before, <laughs> Stan is the Lucky. most cold-natured person I have ever met. We've often hate joked, the cold. I'm from Michigan. We've often joked he's Michigan. literally cold-blooded, like a reptile. Yeah, he's a lizard person lizard. in a human skin. And I'm pretty sure that when he goes home, he suns himself on a rock. <laughs> he wears sweaters in the summertime, and we live in we're in South Carolina. There's no summer in South Carolina. Oh, oh my, my God! God. What? <laughs> There's no summer in South Carolina. Okay, so the fact that you want to live in this frozen wasteland right. the day after tomorrow is well, we end up in Mexico. Me. So, Dave, let's all remember that statement whenever he expresses an opinion on anything else. Well, next time that you say it's too cold somewhere, I'm going to be like, "That's a good thing we're not living in the day after tomorrow." Is remember. It? You wouldn't need a car. It's like when I lived You're in right, Chicago. You're right. You could swim everywhere. <laughs> when I lived in Chicago, I survived the winters by the fact that I didn't have to deal with stuff that the winter caused, like 
dead batteries and because you were hibernating i was hibernating but i also just threw on my big winter shit and got on the train and moved on and 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 i was fine it was fine um but here you have to deal with all the you know and in michigan you had to deal with all the dead batteries and the buried cars and you had to shovel your driveway and blah 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 blah. walk uphill both ways in the snow at least i did and i was barefoot and (laughs) (laughs) i hate winter um and i i hate the cold if you're not snowmobiling or skiing there's no purpose for snow or cold that's what i'm saying but if you ask me if there was a if there was a disaster, an apocalyptic event that I would like to be part of in the sense of media, <laughs> and why it's because of the it's because of the learnedness and the just the the example of humankind actually coming together and building and, and supporting each other and even in the mess of you know end of days they were able to create and uh, maintain a sense of we can we're in this together and we can we can we can get through this together and hopefully we are experiencing some of that right now but there's something about and 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 in the sense of an ice age uh, global warming event there's something tangible you can grasp. Oh, this is this really sucks and it's visible. And you can still be within six feet of each other, blah, 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 blah. Mostly you because know. you need to huddle together for warmth. Exactly. Right, right. In the new ice age. Exactly. In <laughs> which running. you would be miserable. They were running around frozen New York trying to outrun the cold. But you rem- but you got to remember they evacuated any survivors from the nor- northern states down to the southern states or farther into Mexico and into and to the to the bottom half of the northern hemisphere right so it's like they got to warmer areas so i would survive because it would be like you know you would not survive i'm telling you if we if chris and i were in this scenario with you during our trek down to the southern states we would get so we would get so tired of you bitching about how cold it is that we would push you into a frozen lake and that would be remember this is a disaster moment this is this is a thing where it's not just seasonable cold it's it's also a roland emmerich film so it's It's a roland emmerich film and it gets worse but it does get better and and in the sense of the roland emmerich no i've seen his movies (laughs) speaking of which i just saw two uh 2012 <laughs> earlier you so you you want to live in crisis. the world in which the world ended in 2012 have you seen that bad. post on the internet where people, someone's like maybe it did end and this is <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah have, have any of you felt alive since 2012 uh not since 2016 that's for sure but um but but granted like 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 um, day after tomorrow and the growth of knowledge and people gaining knowledge and people gaining perspective through that knowledge, I believe there is some of that happening now. And, and I know you guys are surprised that I would, but I, I, there is some, there is some decent handling of this situation, especially locally. Um, all it took was I, a disaster to bring us all together. I, I, I get why you would go for that, because you're right. At the end of the movie, everyone is like, we have actually learned something from this. <laughs> and it's also ironic that the thing that has currently brought everyone together is making us all social distance. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, But uh, but no, um, and, and I'm not sure why you guys are so... Is it because of Roland Emmerich or because that is just so... I've never understood your appreciation for this movie. And I've told you before, we've had this discussion, like since we've been friends, I think I, when, when you and I initially started working together, you told me the day after tomorrow was one of your favorite films. (laughs) And I almost wasn't friends with you anymore after that. (laughs) I don't understand because (laughs) I don't understand. I don't know. I just don't know how to express it. Because the effects are great. Um, I mean, 
and and the performance is a uh, Jake Gyllenhaal is actually really 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 good and it's it, and it's a early example of how good he becomes right um, as an actor and uh, um, even even who I who, Emmy Rossum uh, plays Jake's love interest and uh, for and and I think you remember this but for some reason I thought it was Kirsten Dunst for a long time is that is that true? But uh, but I think I mixed that up with Spider Man. No, is that yeah. true? <laughs> he asked you to fact check a personal opinion about himself that he doesn't remember. Uh, but I I think I was mixing it up with Spider Man too, since Jake Gyllenhaal was up for Tobey Maguire Spider Man. But but uh, but no, the so cast, you're saying he couldn't become the, the hero, so he became Steel the villain. Steel Ward plays uh, Dennis Quaid's wife and Jake's uh, mother, and she's great, and and uh, um. Like I said, the kids in this movie are they're they're smart. They're not they don't grade on you. Even even the one that is kind of the antagonist to Jake's character. Me and Jake are on first name. Yeah, basis. I was gonna. I, was, well, I wasn't going to bring that up. <laughs> you and Mister Gyllenhaal at the Mr. Is that why you want to be in this world so you can spend more time with Jake? That you know because you know you're gonna be Mysterio, man. Um, he no, he's not. Not, <laughs> not in that world. No, not in that world. <laughs> Movies that. have shut down. <laughs> yes, they have. I imagine that by now, in 2020, maybe the Northern Hemisphere has recovered a little bit. <laughs> um, either that or it's just still a... a well, you know, they were expecting it to be, you know, thousands of years so in, in the movie world, in the universe of the movie. What bothers but, me about that movie that makes me reject the premise outright is the rate of cooling that happens would only happen if the earth stopped moving and that side was pointed away from the sun. It's like the Don't you bring facts into this? <laughs> it's and like science. It could only it could only go that uninhabitable that fast. Like global cooling when it actually happened on the planet took time. They do acknowledge that there's a discussion of what could cause it. And it's like the only thing that can do this Bad is writing. the sun. Well, <laughs> you know, you know and, and you know like solar flares, you know, so, doing something to the yeah, they threw out a bunch of they threw out a bunch of techno babble. Um, but you know, uh, I'm not sure what the exact explanation was, but it is it it was something that was supposed to take another 150. You know, where we're at globally now in our sense of. Emissions. I'll tell you what the explanation like, was. Doctor Hand waved at the audience. <laughs> But, Chris, we know a climatologist we can get on here, right? Do you? Do we? Do we know any climatologists? I will, we've got the kind of time to look one up, you know. Yeah, I'm sure they're not busy right now. There's a giant dog outside. Oh man, um, we should invite the it, dog. In the it's probably like related to one of the wolves that was escaped. Oh my god! During the day after tomorrow, which is a really interesting point. Um, I did, of course, of course, there's moments in there, like when. They have to go outside Jake's character, and, you know, and after he's already told a bunch of people that the storm is going to get it worse and we're going to freeze to death, but he still manages him and his, who he's gotten to be friends with now, the uh, antagonist to, his, to his, him and his lady love's relationship, but um, they're friends now and they go and to get medicine on a, on a medicine ship that has, has medicine? been pushed into the... <laughs> Into the downtown Manhattan by you know the by the flood and the oncoming ice, but uh, um, but they're in the they're in the eye of the storms, and uh, which means it's going to get colder and colder and colder. And it, and it turns out that it it only takes negative one hundred fifty degrees Fahrenheit to freeze gas. Mm. Did you know that? Um, see, um, and because there's a whole section where the planes flew into the super cooled area and their fuel lines froze. And so when they tried to, uh, the helicopters and they've crashed and when the, when the team was trying to get out, they froze like right as they touched the air and there's a whole sequence of that. But of course, you know, being a disaster movie and especially a Roland Emmerich, they can outrun the cold. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. I remember that's, that will seem to be burned into my fucking brain. They can outrun the cold. That is right up there um, with the happenings. We after, have to outrun the wind. After somebody has, you know, gotten their leg hurt and stuff and broken <laughs> and stuff, they, they were able to outrun the outrun the cold while the wolves were chasing them. But uh, <laughs> the wolves that had escaped the zoo that was freezing, the Brooklyn Zoo. But uh, but Day After Tomorrow, um, 
if I was to be trapped in, because I wouldn't want to, I almost watched San Andreas to see if I've never seen it. So it's like, would I, would I want to be in an earthquake situation? You want to be BFFs with The Rock? Uh, but then I'm like, no, I don't want Dennis to Quaid is much more down to earth. I like Dennis Quaid a lot. I always have. And Jake. Uh, and Jake. Your buddy Jake. Hard, my BFF, uh, <laughs> Jake G. Um, uh, but just, just the all encompassing that there's hope. Mm-hmm. You know, and this coming from, you know, the most cynical per- bastard in the world, but the idea that I still have a sense of hope and that, uh, you know, it's like I may m- be misanthropic in my daily life, but I do have. It's just weird. A belief, this is what inspires it in you. <laughs> I do have a belief that um, people as a whole uh, will find a way to make it better. Um, I do have faith in that. Uh, I'm glad you do. <laughs> I, I know, and, it, and it's a dichotomy in my, and it's a paradox. And they, and I was talking, I was ma- mentioning that earlier when, when you were mm-hmm. talking about, you know, the um, fallacies of the argument of how, you know, it could cool so well. And right. there were, uh, Dennis Quaid's character brings up the whole paradox that, you know, the, the uh, melting of the ice caps cause a cooling effect in the mm-hmm. northern Atlantic, and that will... Um, that th- before, you know, that the m- overheating of the ice caps will cause an ice age, and he realizes a paradox and stuff. So they do touch upon all the, you know, questions, and and that's why I was saying about the early the government, you know, denying, you know, climate change and everything, and then you know realizing that oh shit maybe he was right, you know. Um, they do touch into that. And and it's surprising coming from Roland Emmerich, who I think is a crazy person. <laughs> also, he didn't write it. <laughs> he, yeah. Uh, he didn't write it, but, um, and his brother Toby, of course, is in the movie. That, and that's the and mark of a Toby's screenwriter. Not, that's the mark of a screenwriter going, I, I should yeah. probably try and explain this somehow. <laughs> uh, but, uh, cause they at least gave an effort in Sharknado. <laughs> uh, but Roland, there was an effort made. Yeah. Uh, but Roland Emmerich, I, I have to give him credit that, this is the one disaster film that he's said that I that I don't have major problems with his philosophy. In, Not even in, Independence Day. Well, I do. I do love Independence Day, um, and I do. So yes, if if there was another disaster film, of course that's Alien. So that's a given that you know we would want to be part of an. You, you should know, watch Geo Storm. I did watch no, Geo Storm. <laughs> oh, we're not talking about. Geostorm. We're not talking about Geo Storm. <laughs> I just I don't want to beat the frozen corpse of a dead horse into the ground. <laughs> you can't. I'm, the ground's frozen. Yeah, I'm just before we move on. I I just feel the need to say that if. The fates and the universe and Mother Earth and Mother Nature collaborated to force this disaster scenario upon us. You would be dead (laughs) in 24 hours, if not from freezing, because somebody in your party would murder you after the hundredth time you you said, I'm cold. Because... Because there's it's so a fucking difference. cold. I hate it out here. Either Why are we outside? Either that how or... How far is it to the south? Either, there's a difference. Either that or he, he won't stop talking about how he's glad he's got his long johns on. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would have my long I know, and you let us know. Um, you do enjoy telling us that. <laughs> but, but the thing is, is it's, it's a different situation. You know, it's like, even... even I, If I know that there's... You know, I'm holding myself up in this and not going totally bat so but i am a hermit anyway so i guess that doesn't matter but um but the thing is is that if 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 the, if the situation's thrust upon us i'm not gonna i'm not gonna go to my my uh standard you know complaint department to do what i usually do but it, it's the seasonal stuff you know they're just the normal regular seasonal stuff that bothers me um but if it's a if it's a situation like this where I have to stand up, fight or flight, fight or flight, you know, it's like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be with you all to figure out what we can do. I just, as you were saying that figured out what your role in all of this would be. (laughs) You would be the wise old hermit living out by himself that the other main characters encounter when they are in desperate need of someone to help them. And you're either going to take them in 
and give them supplies and help them get back on their journey or you're going to trap them in your basement and use them for f- food and fuel i'm going to and entertainment them. and entertainment i'm because to the contrary of popular belief <laughs> i am not a serial killer with i didn't i would never make that assertion bodies I'm just saying, by disasters house. do weird things to us but uh and i haven't i've yet to come to cannibalism so it's like maybe maybe a frozen ice age would cause me to you say but. you've yet to go, come to cannibalism as though you've been presented with plenty of opportunities you just how, haven't taken how them. often exactly how often do you have a 10 cloverfield lane situation happening <laughs> that's where you- what i'm saying again another situation where but and and since i'm quiet anyway the you know cloverfields or the birdcage stuff that one well birdcage you have to be blind bird. right uh bird, bird box, box. Bird. Bird, the birdcage is a very Actually, different you know scenario. what birdcage i'd like to live through that disaster <laughs> <laughs> that was more of a social disaster than anything else <laughs> bird box excuse me uh birdcage is hilarious and funny, but I don't think it's a disaster film. But uh, Bird Box. I, but no, I'm thinking, again, uh, though, I guess that place, depends right? on who you ask. <laughs> quiet Place, since I'm quiet, that wouldn't even bother me in the sense, you know. But uh, Bird Box might because I like to That see. is the absolute worst universe I would want to live in if it meant being in that plot. And I haven't seen it yet based Dogs. on the fact that you hate it. So I hated that film so thoroughly. Okay, well, that... Um, that certainly is a conundrum that you have found yourself in. Um, <laughs> that I want to be in a That you want to be in the, the day after tomorrow verse. <laughs> Chris, which... Why don't, why don't just be Imagine the Emmerich okay, well, verse if, anyway. If you want the best version of that, you'd want to live in the movie Frozen. <laughs> <laughs> what the... Not the Adam Green Frozen. No, the, uh, uh, Disney. Disney's Frozen. That's not a disaster movie. It is. Is it? She, her ice powers go nuts, and she <laughs> plunges the kingdom into winter. Oh, see, see, I would hate the music. So, <laughs> so that would people would in. break into song around you, and you would just again walk into a frozen lake. <laughs> well, you wouldn't. You wouldn't really. You bad. wouldn't know something's wrong if it's diegetic to the world. So. <laughs> I just imagine a scenario in which Stan is still Stan, the human living in the frozen world of Frozen, and people around him are bursting into song, and it's randomly snowing. What are you doing? I wouldn't mind the bursting into song. It's just well, you do shut good the songs. hell up. Do good songs. I'm trying to play Fallout Four in here. Quit singing. <laughs> I've already played like 14 hours. Elsa, go to hell. <laughs> it's like, imagine the Emmerich universe anyway. It's like, there's disaster every day. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> you can trust yeah, nothing. You can trust nothing in a role in Emmerich universe. <laughs> All right. Chris, a disaster plot that you'd rather be in than the one we're currently living. Well, welcome back to the podcast after tomorrow. <laughs> oh, I forgot to say that um, if you're interested and you want to hear more from Stan, you can listen to his podcast, Jet Fuel Doesn't Melt Steel Beams. Chris? What? Mm. What? What does that mean? That's a good question. Go ahead, Chris. You're not really a conspiracy theorist. I'm not. <laughs> no. Am He's, I? No. I'm not. Sort, no, well, No. No? <laughs> Let's move on. It depends. <laughs> That's it. This is going to be the next half hour of the podcast as the three of us quietly laughing. Go ahead, Chris. Cabin fever has ravaged all aboard. Um, so when you gave me the topic, and be, you, you, know, uh, you, you might know what track I'm on because I ask questions immediately, because my mind immediately went into, what's best for me? <laughs> This is a disaster scenario. I want to survive. And you know what's funny as I was thinking about it? Most disaster movies are really kind of localized. Like, I mean, as, as big as they can get, they're really kind of a localized thing. So if I'm just living in this world, if I'm not directly in it, I can live in most disaster movies. They're fine. It's like San Andreas. Oh, well, shit. A big earthquake hit the, the West Coast. It's like most... We saw that coming. Yeah, it's like most uh, most plane disaster movies. I, I would hear about that on the news or something. <laughs> Um, really, the worst case scenario is living in a another pandemic situation. <laughs> um, and honestly, I was talking to you on the way over, Dave. It's like most of these 
the most action movies would kind of fit too because it's like there's some i mean there's depending on how big the action is and most of it is it's like that's a disaster that's a pretty big disaster um i was thinking about it, i was like what would what would be something i could just i could just uh even if i was directly involved in the events kind of just get through as easily as possible I mean, not without some major ramifications in my life, but it's like, um, and I think the the one the one the one best case scenario um, was reminded to me because of how did this get made, and that's Lake Placid, because Lake Placid is centered around a gigantic. Is it crocodile or alligator? I think it's I've croc- never I think, seen Lake Placid. I don't oh, know. you should. Oh, Lake Placid is great. I mean, it's I'm not, not going to trust the opinion of the man. It's an who alligator. When it comes to America, half hour nah, talking about the but day it came from like uh, it came from like Asia. I think it's so. A croc- it would be a crocodile. I think it's a crocodile, and it's Betty White. It's not a, right. It's Betty. Betty, Betty White's in it. Yeah, foul mouth Betty White's in it. Um, the best kind of Betty White. It's not a great movie, <laughs> but it's great for survival purposes because, as pointed out multiple times in How Did This Get Made, how do you not get eaten by the giant crocodile? You stay out of the lake. <laughs> <laughs> you don't go in the lake. There are officials handling that. Don't go in the lake. <laughs> and Lake Placid's in New York. Don't go in New York. <laughs> and then the other one I touched on, the more severe one, is Armageddon. Mm-hmm. And the reason I chose that one was you do have an asteroid hurtling towards Earth, and we are relying on oil drillers to uh, fix it with a nuclear bomb. But they do fix it. <laughs> so even... <laughs> So even. So you want to live in a scenario in which things just proceed on as normally. Well, kind of, yeah. Wouldn't you? I mean, you? that's fair. <laughs> Wouldn't you? I mean, here's the thing. The the best thing to come out of that is we all realize how close an asteroid came to hitting us, how cl- how close it was that we've managed to take care of it, and hopefully good things come of that. Maybe not. <laughs> it's a cynical world, but it's like maybe. And then and then and then I moved on and I was like, "Okay, so what, what would be something I could possibly get through and not have to worry as much? Well, uh, if I was going through, say, the events of Airplane, it wouldn't be as bad. In an, in an inherently comedic universe. <laughs> even So even, this universe, just with more slapstick. Yes, <laughs> basically. It would, I, how, I, would feel, I would feel better getting through it. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, yeah. right. It would depend on how much awareness you're allowed to have in this universe. But like, like you you have been in this universe the entire time, so you are accustomed to the slapstick. Right. Not you, Chris, currently find yourself in the airplane <laughs> right, universe right. where crazy things are happening all around you. Right. And is slapstick part of the part of the uh, uh, disaster? Who knows? As long as I didn't have the fish, I should be okay. <laughs> But uh, I think, but the one I settled on as there is like the one. This came to me late, and I'm kind of, I'm kind of. This is the one I was like, I should have thought of this sooner. Here's the disaster you can work through pretty easily because at worst you just have a lot of cleanup to do, and that is surviving the events of Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Okay, I've never seen this, or I'm, I'm not it's familiar based, with it. It's based on a classic children's book, and in the movie. Um, an inventor, uh, the the main character named Flint, he's an inventor, and he invents this machine that draws in, I don't, I, it's like, uh, it's like moisture, air moisture and stuff like that, and it's able to turn yeah. it into food, whatever they want. Um, and uh, over the course of the, the, it works for a while, and over the course of the film, it goes out of control and just starts spitting out, like, food, uh, random and huge amounts, and it just becomes, uh, it becomes a crisis that he has to stop. So it's like, one, if when it's working right, you're getting food whenever you want. Literally falling from the sky? It is. <clears throat> Two, when it's out of control, the worst thing that happens is a mess. <laughs> I mean, before, I mean, unless he doesn't stop it and it goes haywire and we're all dead. But Well, yeah. Death by meatball. I mean, yeah. But I really, really, it's the softest disaster. <laughs> okay. All right. And tastiest. Yes. And the taste the tastiest disaster. <laughs> 2020 in review. 
All right. Well, I'm glad I'm not the only one who went through multiple scenarios before I, I landed did. It's on like, mine. Well, I mean, because I didn't want to go for any harder scenarios. Because like the harder the, the I mean, the more I up the ante, the less likely I'm going to live through it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when going through mine, my my first instinct was to go for Mad Max because uh, as Mike from the podcast with Jason and Mike, a uh, uh, friend, uh, some friends of ours with their own podcast, as Mike pointed out on that show, we are basically living in uh, the the build up to Mad Max right now, mm-hmm. just with toilet paper instead of gasoline. Yeah, I don't know if I'm surviving that one. <laughs> I don't have enough leather. <laughs> Um, My favorite theory is that that whole apocalypse scenario just happened in Australia and everyone else is fine. (laughs) Yeah, I was thinking about that, too. Like, oh, right. I don't live in Australia. I think I'd be okay. Um, So that was one of the ones that I picked. Uh, I almost went with the uh, X-Men Days of Future Past uh, plot Hmm. because I am not a mutant and therefore... (laughs) Just like oh you, wow, I know. Just like you said, this Ooh, would not affect just a, me. Just a little quiet genocide what? off in the corner, oh, and then I realized that was probably the uh, most straight white male thought that I've ever had. That's more like um, straight white male in Nazi Germany. Uh, yeah, <laughs> a, so I, I immediately tra- felt guilty about that one. Huh? Where are those trains going? Yeah. Um, so da-da. definitely, don't think I want to live in that one after giving that some thought. Um, ultimately. I ended up going with one very simple and straightforward, um, going with the George Romero blank of the dead universe. Okay. Because, and specifically Romero's of the dead universe. I think I understand why. Not any of the imitators that came out afterwards. Um, because one, the zombies are slow. Yes. And really only a danger if they amass in large quantities. Two, every single one of uh, Romero's zombie films showed us Darwin at work at its best. I specifically think of uh, one scene near the end of Dawn of the Dead, where a bunch of bikers, including Tom Savini, uh, bust into the mall that the main characters have Uh, been holed up in for weeks or months and they are trying to take back them all and by busting in they let all the zombies in so one of these bikers goes up to a blood pressure machine and sticks his arm in the sleeve and is having his blood pressure taken (laughs) when zombies overtake him pull him away from the machine which rips off his arm and that's just if this scenario happens and all of the world's dumbest people also die in the scenario all right. I mean, is that's, that harsh? That's fair. Yes. Isn't that, isn't that Unfortunately, what all, that doesn't happen. Though. Isn't that, that's fair because I mean, Romero's movies often teach us you can survive it as long as you know you employ teamwork and don't be a dick. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, much like all zombie fiction has, has come to show us over the last uh, sixty, fifty, or sixty years. It's the humans you got to worry about yeah. nine times out of yes. ten. Um, and, you know, humans being terrible assholes, that's something that we are pretty much dealing with. So it basically we'd be in the exact same scenario we are now just with zombies and maybe less dumb people. That's why I picked it. Now, I damn near went with the Resident Evil universe for the same reason, except in the Resident Evil universe, you've got things like the Tyrant and Nemesis mm-hmm. and Lickers. You've got bosses. <laughs> yeah. And mutated uh, tarantulas that oh, are... Oh, God. You would shit yourself. That, yeah. Man-sized I mean, I would tarantulas too. and... Uh, giant bees. Giant bees and wasps. Uh, sharks. Mutated yeah, sharks. Oh, yeah. Mutated There's sharks. sharks in, in, uh, in Zero, one of the least famous favorite one of the least good ones but yeah yeah they're, they they um they introduce a lot of well no sharks were in the first one i i've never actually played the first one sharks so. were in the first one they, they there's like a flooded segment of the the lab where a, they had a shark for some goddamn reason well and in this universe depending on where you live you might just have to deal with multiple dr salvadors the uh oh, guy God. with the, the cha- burlap sack on his head chasing you with the chainsaw Oh, and don't forget the Chainsaw Sisters from that game, too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know the Chainsaw Sisters. So, yeah, that's what I decided to go with. Uh, that's why I decided to go with the Romero zombie verse over mm-hmm. the Resident Evil verse. Less mutated spiders and wasps to deal with. I didn't know we could 
I thought we were doing like real, yeah, uh, applicable. Uh, so you know, I can. Well, that one done kind like of is that Lord one is, of the Rings, Lord well, of the Rings, <laughs> Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Well, I mean, Lord at that point, universe. you're no longer living the, in the, the our Rome. universe. You are now in Middle Earth. The Romero one is basically a it's basically a pandemic situation. Um, you're, yes, you're right. Yeah, it starts off localized, yeah. gets out of hand. It, yeah, those movies only serve to prove if you're not in such a hurry to sacrifice each other to the problem, uh, you can get out of it. And and, and yes, and and uh, you're totally right, Chris, with the Romero stuff being. Um, being again not necessarily just darwin at its best but the fact that people treating each other well is what's going to help a whole lot you know and uh um which again i go back you know the cynical bastard believes that there is a underlining underpinning lining to human nature that they will end up working together in some way positively so to solve the problem um yeah because the zombies in those movies are a consequence they're not they're not the mm -hmm. aggressor exactly yeah. exactly and by the fourth film land of the dead which a lot of people hate i enjoy uh i think it's it was the last good blank of the dead film that romero did um by land of the dead you see that they have rebuilt whole cities Exactly, um, but they are facing a very uh, similar problem to real life, where these mega cities are inhabited solely by the rich, whose lifestyles don't really seem to have changed much by ne by that point. While oh. the outside of these cities are still populated by the lower class, and uh, it, it managed to be uh, topical and fantastical at the same time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So. Ramirez universe still shows that progress is possible. You're just still going to have to deal with assholes. So again, like I said, it's essentially this universe, but with zombies. Absolutely. I it's agree. like a political cartoon come to life. Exactly. So do you guys have any more disaster uh, plot thoughts? Any <laughs> other ones that you considered? Stan, did you ever, did you think of any before you, I, well, I, I know we were talking to you when you decided on uh, day after tomorrow, but did you consider any other possibilities? Oh, um, I had, considered deep impact um core uh deep impact solely for the fact that when uh elijah wood's death by <laughs> by giant flood that takes out all of new york with uh, including the statue of liberty so when he's getting drowned you see the statue of liberty flowing by and then uh the core where they have where where this is your uh one of your things Chris, is that one of the things the magnetic oh, yeah, of, yeah. The, of the inner uh, under the crust, the magnetic core, if that's adjusted or manipulated in a way that it goes off center, that can cause. I've heard about that one. There's also another one involved the sun. Is there's there's that different? I think the sun um, and the core, the 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 the, the, the solar flares mm -hmm. affected the that's inner, of, and that's so the they had to go of, yeah. into the core, and they had to basically blow it up to mm -hmm. uh re reignite it reignite the uh, uh uh core and the balance uh and so and but deep impact um and that uh that was always a favorite of mine i actually saw that in the theater and um the uh, the idea of the asteroid actually hitting in that sense you know and uh the extinction event level catastrophe that just a relatively small piece of an asteroid because they do do the atomic bomb and mm -hmm. but when they hit it it splits into two or three or four pieces so you know there's like two pieces that hit the earth and so it's a relatively small chunk but it's big enough to cause oh know, absolutely yeah no, absolute that's... damage and so the science i would like to know when you bring them in, in the climatologists and the arguments against day after tomorrow how how connected is deep impact in the core you know it's like is is that possible you know all right well we'll just start composing this list this <laughs> but, q a with our climatologist but those two again or the idea of you know and then anything with bill pullman is the 
president? Yeah, see, I wanted to bring up another one that I considered was um, Independence Day solely because I'm pretty sure I'm one of the ones who would have died in the first strike, and therefore I wouldn't have anything to worry about. Right. Well, either that, well, either that or just living where we live. I mean, I feel like since they went after major cities, we'd have a larger chance of survival. Yeah. It's like who's because I don't I don't see even Charlotte on the list of uh, up there with New York and uh, Fran- and Paris and plus I mean look where we're at these rednecks would handle the alien problem in days <laughs> that's yeah that's something that uh, like I, I feel like they don't but uh, then it, but going to your point David is like they are also hopefully the dumb people that would be called. <laughs> Cold or outright murdered by aliens? Murdered by aliens. Yeah. You know that. Hopefully, hopefully the dumb people are. You know, and, and by dumb I mean you know, just the absolute worst of examples of human beings that we have. That they that they are the ones, but history shows that they usually aren't. Well, I mean. Because Independence Day did go out of its way to be extra cruel by showing us that group of people who got up on a roof and were like, welcome, aliens, and then immediately get blown, <laughs> blown up, up by them. Yeah. Like, well, dick move, aliens. You, <laughs> I feel like you were being welcomed. <laughs> they were just trying to say hi. This I first f- contact. I feel like... <laughs> I feel like the Independence Day universe leads to a weird alternate star fleet where it's like we've discovered there's aliens out there and they want to kill us. So we're going to band together as one and go, fuck you, Space Force. (laughs) Um, But yeah, and then then, then there's the BS, the Battlestar Galactica universe, which was because that starts out with a major disaster, you know. But uh, but yeah, um, anything with Bill Pullman as president or. You know, uh, more Morgan Freeman is president, which I think Deep, Deep Impact has. Uh, you just want to, you know, follow them. Day after tomorrow had had um, Perry King as the president, which he was okay, but he was like a minor Bill Pullman. <laughs> uh, last one that I want to bring up is I also considered the Matrix universe, uh, just because I would have been that guy who was like, nope. Uh, give me the blue pill. <laughs> I'm good. Keep me plugged in. And I'll be part of the simulation all day long. Y'all have fun long. with the revolution. I I got work in the morning. Yeah, Bob. wake me up when you destroy the system. I guess I don't know. I did, no, I, you I think understand so. that. You, I, do you think you would be that? I yeah. Kinda. I would. I would hope that I would choose not to be that person, and I would hope I would hope I that know. you guys Cypher would choose. Made a, Cypher made a good point about how, how good steak tastes in the Matrix. <laughs> and also, once yes, again, I say, Stan, you would take the red pill, and they would wake you up, and you would get cold. <laughs> and be like, I fucking hate it. I want to go back world. in the goo. <laughs> Put me back in. Put me back in the Matrix where I had central heat. <laughs> again, it's a different situation. It's not regular time it's different <laughs> it's it's you know disaster what about, what so about monster like, movies I, did you guys think up. about monster movies at all i did think of monster movies um definitely you know any of the gam i actually almost watched gamera stuff again oh, last okay. night you know and be, especially to, the later ones Is they're there, about to release them all on blu-ray yes the, yeah. the older ones yeah uh, all, pretty much all the gamera movies i think um because like the newer stuff is what i'm really into. yeah the classics so, they are about to release um, the classics so like and the newer Godzillas and stuff like that, and especially like King of the Monsters. And, mm-hmm. uh, I definitely don't want to find myself living in the 1998 Godzilla. Not universe. the 19, not, not the Matthew Broderick. Not the uh, yeah. Not, not, I don't want to live in the universe with the one that lays eggs. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm fine with the one that just keeps popping up in Japan. Uh, and again, you Alien know, that's a very Predator localized universe. Yeah. That's a very localized problem because if you don't live in Japan, you're probably going to be Real fine. Time. Probably, but like Godzilla, King of the Monsters, well, even the first Godzilla, uh, the Gareth Edwards, and then uh, uh, the new, the new uh, MonsterVerse stuff, uh, King Kong, Skull Island, um, any of that, that would be just a blast. It's like there's monsters, they're giant, or or uh, Pacific Rim universe would be awesome too. Uh, if I mean, I, I mean, if you learn to pilot one of the mechs, yeah. Um, you brought up the no, alien. I would not want to <laughs> Pacific Rim universe. <laughs> you brought up the alien versus predator universe. No. Yeah, I could do that because uh, why? The three of us would be fine. We pose zero threat to a predator. It would not try to hunt us. No, no. I'm talking about like as long as it's not as long as it's one or as long as it's like that universe and not like AVP where they come to Earth. <laughs> oh well, yeah. There's that. Well, that's what, that's why it's like 
that's the one I would like to be participating no. in. No! <laughs> I don't want them near me. <laughs> I want them on the Nostromos out there. Um, but then I would want to be on a, the Nostromos or on no. the uh, You would immediately going. have eggs laid in you. So be it. I, I, I could be John Hurt's character, man. Is it, blah, 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 and have the greatest chest bursting he moment was a of robot. all time. Wait, no. No, you're thinking of no. Ian Holm. Oh, I'm sorry. Ian Never yeah, mind. Ian Holm, who's also in Day After Tomorrow. And he's also Bilbo Baggins. He's also I Bilbo think of that every single time Katie and I watch <laughs> Alien. <laughs> All right. Well, those are our disaster movie scenarios we would rather, or in some cases, can not we, rather be living in. Can we go back to living in the dumbest political thriller instead of the dumbest uh, disease movie? Which one would that be? Uh, just regular politics, you know, that before the, this virus struck. Well, it's not exactly a, an original thought because everyone loves to point it out on the internet, but we are basically uh, rapidly heading towards the world of idiocracy. Yeah, I thought about that one, too. I didn't know if it would count, though, because it's not necessarily... It, well, it's not a traditional disaster movie. It's a creeping slow one, and yeah. It, I also wonder how much we are moving towards living in the reality of Westworld. But, uh, yeah, so that's what we've got. Well, uh, I feel like I'd survive that, too. Be the one where rich people go play with robots all day. That doesn't affect me. <laughs> Well, the plot of the third season does involve a potential robot uprising, so it would eventually affect you. I hopefully, <laughs> if you don't get on board with your robot overlords, Look, see, that's I, what I keep saying. That's what I'm we, waiting for. The next disaster is going to be the robot uprising. The Planet of the okay. Apes. Okay, but honestly, I, I don't think I'd treat a robot poorly. I don't I certainly wouldn't hunt them for sport. Wait, are you saying that you want to live in the? Um, um, I'm sorry, you just said um, the, Planet of the Apes. The the uh, You want to live on the Planet of the Apes. I don't know how you would say that, but uh, yeah, I'm sure I would be a slave to the apes for a while. But I and that is like ideal to you. I would be like one of their teachers. Or one of their servants. <laughs> People always say they want a monkey butler. Well, now they've the monkeys have got a human butler, and his but name it, is Stan. Especially the, the newer ones. They're going to make him ride um, trikes and smoke cigars. Hey, uh, it, it, I mean, if you have Andy, you know, uh, Andy Circus as your uh, Caesar, I mean, yeah, yeah, that would be an awesome. University. Specifically, Andy Circus <laughs> as a monkey, <laughs> as a chimpanzee, as a chimpanzee. There's a difference in this universe. This is getting very confusing. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys for being part of this insane discussion. I applaud you for not shutting it off sooner, I guess. Yeah. Um, So in a couple of weeks, we will be back uh, to continuing our Quarantino discussion with Pulp Fiction. Um, Before that, you can look forward to the WrestleMania episode of This is a Work that's coming out sometime next week, hopefully within a week of uh, WrestleMania airing. And uh, then a couple weeks after that, we will have uh, This is a Takeover, the first full-length episode of that, hosted by Shelby Ray and Gina Belmont, uh, where they will talk about the NXT matches that would have been part of the pay-per-view. So until then, uh, Chris, where can people find you online if they want to reach out to you? They shouldn't. Okay. (laughs) And Stan, we know that you're uh, social media distancing. I mean, I'm on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck finding a Stan Lee when you get on and, Facebook. And, and I have Zoom now. <laughs> In case anybody out there wants to Zoom you. Exactly. Okay. Oh, I guess we you should, have to tell me your, you know, how to get to your meeting. We should have business meetings. That's one. <laughs> Just for the sake of having them? Yes. All right. Well, if you want to follow me online, my Instagram is primarily pictures of my dogs or the alcohol that I'm drinking. But if you feel like following that, <laughs> uh, you can follow me at DB Hensley. You can follow us on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash long walk pro. You can search for our fan page, long walk talks, ampersand. This is a work. And in the show notes, you can find links to our YouTube channels if you want to check out more of our original content. If you enjoy all of our shows, please make sure to leave us a rating and a review so that we can get some more visibility. You should follow Dave's Instagram. His dogs make the weirdest faces. They do. It's adorable. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening, and we'll be back soon. Peace out.